Michael, open up this a, is a in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you,
Every time you talk about the word, you pray the word with the Lord, every time you're in praise and worship, man, that seed is being watered, and that seed is growing, and that seed does not stop growing even in the time of drought, even in the time where the earth is scorched with the heat of death. That seed does not stop growing. It does not stop moving. It does not stop acting on your behalf. And if you could have eyes to see God in you in those moments, you could see that God wasn't shaking. You could see that he's not anxious, that he's not afraid, that he's not wondering how you're going to overcome. He's not wondering how you're going to be free. He's not wondering how he's going to bring forth life in you. He is life. Yes, he is. Right? Yeah. And so the, the Holy Spirit, man, when we preach the gospel, when we preach the word of life, Jesus said, my words, they are spirit and they are life. When we preach the word of life, it's the releasing of the Holy Spirit in the room. And what happens is the Holy Spirit hovers. You know, like in Genesis where it said yes. the Holy Spirit was released in the earth yeah. and it hovered over the face of the deep, the darkness right. and the chaos yeah. and the nothingness. And it was hovering there to yeah. incubate life. When you look at that in the Hebrew, it says like a mother hen That's would right. hover over her eggs to incubate That's life. Right. The Holy right. Spirit yeah. was hovering there. That Holy Spirit's in you. Amen. And it's hovering in your heart. Thank you. And you know what it's doing? It's incubating life. That's right. And so when someone comes preaching the gospel, they're releasing that spirit, and that spirit that's coming out of their mouth is connecting with the spirit hovering in your heart, yeah. and it's incubating life, yeah. right? Amen. And so we want to be mindful of that. Yeah. With that being said, I always have a bunch of things that, that I can talk about, but I wanted to give people the opportunity. Question. Before I got into <laughs> before I got into to a, to a, a long dissertation. I'm not here that often, and so right. if there's if there's questions yeah. for people, yep. I'd like right to here. give people. It <laughs> <laughs> looks like you got it all figured out. <laughs> I wanted you to explain the Book of James. Oh, huh. that's okay. A question. Yeah, well, hold on. Because I think question. that needs to be explained. That is a long, big question. Um, (laughs) But see how quickly the Holy Spirit can concise it. A couple of things you want to understand when you're reading the book of James. You have to define a couple of terms very properly, and if you don't define those terms properly, you're going to come out with a complete wrong understanding. First term you want to define properly is the word faith that's used there. right? And I don't know if you guys realize, but when we read the word faith in the Bible, we automatically assume it's an action and it's verb and it's talking about us believing. Mm -hmm. That word faith in the letter of James, it's not a verb. It's not a verb. It's a noun. That's right. It's a noun. It's not a verb. And it's not talking about you believing. No. That's not what it's talking about. Now, we do believe. That's right. Right? But it's talking about the faith where Paul said that he was given his apostleship from the Lord to bring about obedience to the faith. And so when you look at that word faith in the letter of James in the Greek, the definition is the gospel truth itself. The gospel truth itself. The gospel truth itself. Okay? And we talk all the time how grace is a person. And we say amen to that because Jesus came full of grace and truth. Yes. Mm-hmm. But faith is also a person, That's right. right? And it's Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ is the faith of God. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's why Paul said that he lived in this world by the faith of the Son of God. He was talking about a faith that entered into the earth through the person of Jesus. And this faith is the gospel truth itself. Amen. Okay? Amen. Another meaning of that word faith, that noun, it's a noun. It comes from the root word that means to persuade someone else of something. Mm -hmm. And specifically, it means to persuade someone else that you're their friend. Mm. So it would speak of someone coming to you to persuade you that they are your friend. Mm -hmm. Right? That they come to be good to you. I mean, doesn't the gospel tell us about how Jesus is the friend of sinners? Right? Didn't Jesus come into the earth to persuade sinners that he's their friend? That's right. And didn't he come to reveal that God is our friend? Yes. Right? When we thought God was our enemy, Jesus came into the earth, and what did he do? He warred against the sin and death that was warring against us. Your sin is forgiven you. Right? And so that's the meaning of that word faith. You really want to have that down. The next meaning, the next word, and I could go into a bunch of words, but the work. That's right. The word work that's used in the letter of James. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand what that word's talking about, you're never going to understand the letter of James. Mm -hmm. Now, the scriptures use that word work all of the time. I don't know if you guys realize this, but our vernacular, or our interpretation of that word work is talking about something that we do outwardly. Mm -hmm. Right? We think of do work. And when we think of doing work, what do we think of doing? 
something outwardly. Something we're going to perform outwardly. Well, there's hundreds of scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about the deed or the work that's performed as being something that happens in the heart. That's right. Something that happens in the heart. And we'll just read one of the verses. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to write this verse down and go read it for yourself, we are going to look at Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Amen. I think that's the, the right one. Let's see. Bear with me as I read it. Okay. Y'all want to bear with me as I just read it? Where shall I? I'll pick it up from verse 7. We'll pick it up from Jeremiah 17, 7. Mm -hmm. It's important that you understand what the word work is talking about when you read the scriptures. Because if you don't know what it's talking about, you're going to read a completely opposite interpretation into the scriptures. Yeah. This is Jeremiah. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Is that talking about something you do outwardly or yeah. something that happens in your heart? Yeah. Okay, he goes on. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, listen to what the Lord says. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So see God talking about he gives somebody a reward according to the work they perform or according to the deed. Another translation says according to their doings, like the one I just read. Now, if you read it in its context, he just said what, the, the, what he weighs in the balance when he thinks of what someone has done. What did he say that he weighs in the balance when he thinks of what someone's done? Where's your heart? Where's your heart? He says he tries the heart. When he thinks about the work a person's done, the Lord is thinking about the heart. Which ought to make sense to us because Jesus said that he came and doesn't judge people after the flesh. He judged people according to the heart. And so the work that, it, that the scriptures are talking about, and James in particular, is talking about what you've done in your heart. And there's a slew of scriptures that talk about this. Paul talks about every person being receiving according to the deed that they performed. It's not talking about what you did outwardly. It's not talking about the ministry you performed. It's not talking about the good that you did or the bad that you did outwardly. It's not talking about whether you loved people good or whether you hated people or not. The deed that it's talking about is the deed of did you trust in the Lord or not? Was your trust in your own works or was your trust in the Lord? Those are the two deeds. There's only two works a person can perform. They can either make the arm of God their hope or they can make the strength of man's hand their hope. They're the only two works you can do. Jesus talking about Abraham. And it's no accident that Abraham uh, is mentioned in the letter of James when it talks about the work that justifies you. He says, well, not, was not Abraham justified by works? Well, how many of you immediately think that that's talking about the things Abraham did outwardly? How many of you immediately think that? Well, at some point, if you hadn't already got there, you'll come to the, the place in your life where you're like me. You realize there's one person that knows. And you don't get to decide, Greg. And neither does anybody else get to decide what the work Abraham performed was. Do you know why none of us get to decide? Because Jesus is rabbi. Have one master. Jesus come and said, don't call many people master. Don't call many people rabbi. That's what it means. For you have one rabbi. There's one with the authority to interpret the scriptures. There's one who has the authority to interpret what the work of Abraham actually was. And guess what? James is the brother of Jesus. And so James would have been intimately acquainted with what Jesus said. Okay, let's fast forward to what Jesus said about the work of Abraham. When he encountered the Pharisees and they said they were the children of Abraham, what did Jesus say to them? You're not the seed of Abraham. If you were the seed of Abraham, you would do the work that Abraham did. Everybody know the account I'm talking about? Well, what did Jesus go on to say right after he said you would do the work of Abraham? He said, Abraham rejoiced in my day. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. That's Jesus describing the work that justified Abraham. <laughs> Jesus says, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. 
The Pharisees were not rejoicing in Jesus' day. They didn't do the same work Abraham did. So there's Jesus himself describing the work of Abraham mm -hmm. as he saw Jesus' day and he rejoiced. And it ought not be a surprise to us because you know what Abraham said when he went up the mount? When Isaac and everybody else asked him where the sacrifice was? The Lord will provide himself a lamb. Well, who's the lamb? Jesus. Jesus. Do you know what else Hebrews goes on to say that Abraham said? That God even possesses the ability to raise the dead. So there's Abraham believing on the lamb God would provide. And there's Abraham believing that God can even raise the dead. Paul would go and describe Abraham as saying that Abraham didn't consider the deadness he saw in his body or the deadness in Sarah's womb, but he considered God. He gave glory to God. He saw God will provide himself a lamb to cause death to pass over me. God can even raise me from the dead. And so Abraham saw that God would preserve the promised seed. Paul talks in Galatians 3 about the promised seed. And he says, seed duh, not seeds. And do you know who he says the promised seed was? Jesus. And so in Isaac shall your seed be called. And so Abraham saw that he'd be the father of many nations through God raising Jesus from the dead, through God providing himself a lamb. That lamb would take his death into himself, and then God would raise him from the dead, thus preserving the promised seed. Amen. That's what Abraham saw. That's what he was looking at. Do you guys see that? It even says in James when he believed on the mount. What's well, so, a what could justify Abraham? We don't even think about these things. What is it that would justify Abraham? Do you know what the word justification means? It means to appear in the likeness of what God called you. To be as you ought to be. What did God call Abraham? The father of many nations. Well, what would cause Abraham to appear as the father of many nations? That's the only way. Faith is the only way Abraham could be the father of many nations because he would have to be the father of Jews and Gentiles. He would have to be the father of everyone who would later do the same work. What work? The work of believing that God will provide himself a lamb. God can even raise the dead. What are we all believing today? God will provide himself a lamb. God has provided himself a lamb. God has raised the dead. What are we believing on? We're believing the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What was Abraham believing? The resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that could cause Abraham to be justified on the mount is if it was revealed on the mount that he did the work of trusting in the Lord in his heart. He believed on God instead of his own strength in his heart. That's the work that he did, right? Mm -hmm. That's the work we've all done. Mm -hmm. Okay? You guys, are you guys following that? Uh, and so that verse in James, the famous verse. Hold on, hold on. Oh. I want to. I'm going to keep. Oh. I'm going to keep building on it. Mm -hmm. So, James is talking about the work, right? And he says, "Faith without, work. without works is dead." Okay. Now we're going to insert some of these definitions, so we can try and connect it. Remember, faith is the gospel truth itself. The gospel truth itself is powerless to produce fruit in you if you don't believe it. The gospel truth itself is powerless to produce peace in you in the day you encounter tribulation if you don't continue in what the gospel truth itself says. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the work that James was talking about. He even said that you're not doers of the word. He says you haven't done the work. You're forgetful hearers. And then how does he describe that? He talks about them looking into the perfect law of liberty and then not continuing in the perfect law of liberty. So they didn't do the work of continuing in the gospel truth itself. That's what the letter of James is talking about. So these guys were encountering hard times and tribulation. That's why he begins the letter talking about a faith that's precious and pure. It's been tried in the fire. He said this faith, when you squeeze this faith, it can produce patience in your heart. And he goes into how you, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in, in heaven. If any man be tempted, let no one say God's the one tempting them. What's interesting is we say God tested Abraham. But James comes and says, don't ever let anyone say that it's God who tempts anyone. And so the problem for the people in the letter of James is they had believed on Jesus, but then they encountered hard times. 
Because I don't know if you guys realize that for a Jewish person to believe in Jesus meant that they were going to be outcasts. Mm -hmm. They were going to be persecuted and they were going to be separated from the community. Mm -hmm. So these guys believed on Jesus and then they started experiencing hard times. That's why the letter of James starts off with, to the 12 tribes, scatter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so these guys encountered hard times. Their soul was subverted. That's why James talks about the saving of the soul. He's not talking about eternal salvation. He's talking about what's going to save your soul in the day you encounter hard times. Mm -hmm. What's going to save Jesus' soul in the day he was nailed to the tree? Mm -hmm. What was going to save his soul in that place? When Jesus was nailed to the cross and he needed peace, what was going to give Jesus peace? How was he going to get peace in that place? This is what James is talking about. Mm -hmm. You guys are encountering hard times. You're in need of peace. The only thing that can give you peace is something called the perfect law of liberty. Mm -hmm. Because that perfect law of liberty declares to you how God got it right to liberate your life from this earth and hide your life with himself in Christ. That perfect law of liberty will tell you about how you have a life that overcomes tribulation. And what will happen is, is if you continue in that perfect law of liberty, if you do the work of continuing in the gospel truth itself, that gospel truth will produce peace in you. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's what it's talking about. Yes. The letter of James is the same exhortation as every letter in the New Testament. It's the same thing Paul said when he talked to the Galatians about walking in the Spirit or walking after the flesh. He says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. That's right. What we, he wasn't talking about eternal salvation there. No. He was talking about the fruit of the Spirit. That's right. Right? Christ is not going to be able to produce peace and love and joy in you if you're busy looking to the strength of your hand to be justified with life instead of looking to what God's done through the spirit of his life to justify you. That's right. And that's why James goes into the same kind of a thing, the works of the flesh. You guys are busy trying to serve yourself with peace. And because you're trying to serve yourself with peace, what's happening now is you're preferring the rich people over the poor people. Yeah. Right. And you're not visiting the poor people with the gospel. You're preferring the rich people because you're so stressed out by your hard times, you're yeah. trying to win favor Come from the rich people. Amen. Knoweth ye not that God has chosen the rich of this, the poor of this world rich in faith? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. He says we've been begotten from the word of truth. If you go and read carefully in the context there, James chapter 1, verse, or, yeah, verse 26, 27, 28, mm -hmm. it specifically says what the work is. That's right. And do you know what it says that it is? To continue in the perfect law of liberty. Amen. That's the work. That's right. You don't have to tell a person to do good things that's filled with peace and love and joy. That's right. You don't have to come and tell them to visit the brokenhearted with loving kindness. Mm -hmm. Because if a person is filled with the love of God, that's what they're going to be doing anyway. Right. You ain't got to tell a person filled with the love of God they have to do good deeds. That's right. You can't stop them from doing it. That's right. So the question is, what's the work someone could do to be filled with the life of God? What is it? Believe. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Right? But what you have to understand is God presented us with his faith. It says God created everything by the spirit of faith. Yeah. It says God who called forth light out of the midst of, midst of the darkness through the spirit of faith. He creates everything through faith. It says that Jesus created everything. That's the faith. God created everything through the faith. And so this faith comes and declares a truth to us. And it comes to persuade our heart of something. It comes to persuade our hearts that God is our Father. Yes, and that God will not suffer us to see corruption. He will not allow our lives to be overcome by this world. And He has come and liberated our lives from this world. And He has taken our life and gotten it right to hide our lives with Him in Christ. That's the faith. Now this faith comes to persuade you that that's the truth. Right. Now, this is where the work comes in. There's only two works. Right. You either going to allow your heart to be persuaded, that's yeah. the truth, or are you going to harden your heart to that? That's right. And you're going to refuse to be persuaded that that's, that's right. the truth. Yeah. Those are the two deeds that the scriptures talk about all throughout. That's in the Old Testament, when it gets into Revelation, where Paul starts talking about the judgment seat of Christ, and he talks about every person receiving the reward for the deed that they've done, he's talking about in the heart. That's right. When Paul talks about the children of disobedience, that word disobedience, do you know what that word disobey means? To refuse to be persuaded. That's right. mm -hmm. To refuse to be persuaded. Do you know what the word obedience means in Romans where Paul said his apostleship was given for the obedience to the faith? Do you know what that word obedience means? To allow yourself to be persuaded. Be persuaded. Mm -hmm. And so Abraham, if you look at Abraham, at first Abraham 
was not persuaded. That's right. What did God say to Abraham? I am your shield and your buckler. I'm your exceedingly great reward. Yeah. Right? I, pro- I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I call you the father of many nations. Well, Abraham's like, what shall you give me, Lord? <laughs> See, right. look at me. I have no heir. How are you going to give me anything? <laughs> How are you going to give me anything? And he's thinking of Sarah. Sarah's womb's dead. He's yeah. looking at the deadness in himself, the deadness in Sarah's womb. It, well, he wasn't quite dead yet. He still had a little bit of seed. Yeah. And so, well, I'll lay with Hagar. That must be how it's going to happen. There he is walking after the flesh. That's do you right. see? Yeah. He didn't do the work of continuing in what God said to him. That's right. Okay? Yeah. So then there's, there's God's like, well, God bless Abraham. You know, he came out of Ur of the Chaldees, and they were idol worshipers. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to despise Abraham because no. it took a lot just for him to leave by himself. Yeah. Right? He's like, I, I know what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. We're going to let 17 years go by, and we're going to let Abraham's seed dry up. To where they're both completely dead in their bodies. And then we're going to come and tell them again. Okay? That's where you get into El Shaddai. Everybody knows about God being revealed as El Shaddai. That's where God says to Abraham, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and you shall be perfected. Walk before me, look at the strength in my hand and not the strength in your own hand, and you will appear as the father of many nations. You will be exceedingly fruitful. Amen. Right? Yes. And then he changes their names. Yeah. From Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. Well, he added the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is the letter for grace. That's right. And so he added the letter of grace to their name to further testify that it would be by the strength of his hand yeah. and not Abraham's strength. Well, that's when Abraham was persuaded Amen. and he did the work. And God didn't test Abraham on the mountain like we think of testing. When you look at the Hebrew, what it means is God saw the faith in Abraham's heart and he wanted to bring it out in the open so everyone else could see it. Mm-hmm. Because everyone else that was going to come after him were going to need an account in the scriptures of the work that Abraham did. And so when it says, actually what it says is God proved Abraham. And what it means is, is he proved the faith that was in Abraham's heart. He brought it out in the open so everyone else could see it. God already knew Abraham believed. He didn't have to figure out if Abraham believed. And so what does Abraham say? God will provide himself a lamb. The God who can even raise the dead. God will preserve the promised seed. Yeah. And in God preserving the promised seed, Jesus Christ, we will be served with eternal life. Mm-hmm. We will be decorated in the fruit of God's life. We will overcome the deadness in our bodies and the deadness in the earth. That's the work Abraham did. He allowed himself to be persuaded. Amen. Right? Yeah. So listen, we all know, does anybody think someone can be saved without believing on the gospel truth? No. no. Okay, well then isn't that the work? So do you see then how the gospel truth is powerless to save you if you don't do the work of believing on it? If you don't allow yourself to be persuaded, God will be the father of your life and you keep trying to be the father of your own life? Listen, you can't produce the fruit of God's life. But if you can hear the gospel and you can hear that God promised you he would make you exceedingly fruitful, he promised you he will decorate you in the fruit of his life. If you can hear that word and you can be persuaded that that is the truth, you'll find the fruit of life manifesting in you. You'll have done the work. Right? right? Jesus de- defines the word work again. It's, I mean, I feel like I've said this so many times that it feels like it's trivial, but nothing Jesus says is trivial. Go and read John 6. The disciples specifically asked him, what are the works of God that we might work them? Yeah. Did Jesus say to feed the homeless? No. Believe. There's nothing wrong with feeding the homeless, guys. Yeah. I also feed the homeless all the time. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Did he say that you must perform a ministry? This is the work of God? No. There's nothing wrong with ministry. I minister every waking moment of my life. That that ain't the work. I promise you that. That's the fruit of the work that I did. That's me having been persuaded that God is the father of my life and that he has braided my life together with his life and that nothing in this world can separate me from life. And now out of me being persuaded of that, it's a tree of life inside of me. And you see the fruit pouring out of me. But the fruit pouring out of me is not the work. It's not the work. It's the fruit of God's working. So how am I going to say that's my works? Am I the one producing the fruit, or is it the Holy Spirit producing the fruit? Okay. Well, then who's the one doing the work? When God made Adam, was all the work already finished? Or did God make Adam on day three and tell Adam he's got to do some works? No. 
In fact, God did all the work, and then he made Adam after all the work was done. Do you know what the one work Adam needed to do was? Continue in the good work God performed. Walk in my good works. Enter my rest. How do you enter God's rest? You walk in his good work. I promise you, if you walk in the good work God's done to serve you with life, you will be put to rest. Jesus on the cross. Do you know how his flesh was put to rest on the cross? you know why he didn't come down off the cross? He saw the Father does work. And he saw that he needed life. And he saw that he needed something to overcome the death that came upon his body. And he saw the work that the Father would do. He saw the Father would raise him from the dead in glorified immortal flesh that could never die again. And do you know the good work Jesus did? He continued in the work he saw the Father would do. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that put him to rest. Amen. Yeah. And so the scripture is riddled with all of that. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And so will the fruit of the Spirit come out of us? And will we find ourselves visiting... The, the fatherless and the widows with the gospel? Absolutely. That's not the work. That's the fruit of the work. And to a Jewish... Is anybody here Jewish? Okay. Well, us Gentiles, I tell you what, we struggle to understand Jewish vernacular. You know, we have slang. In New Orleans, we got a bunch of slang. Right? Down in New Orleans where the blues was born. It takes a cool cat to blow a horn. On the side of Rampart Street. The Mardi Gras plays with the Mambo beat. Now y'all are like, what does that mean? (laughs) You understand the words, Mm -hmm. but you don't know what it means. And I left you to try to sort out what it meant. You'd get it all wrong. Mm -hmm. You know why? You ain't from New Orleans. (laughs) But every person in New Orleans would know exactly what that song's about. Mm -hmm. So James is a Jewish guy, and he's writing the Jewish guys. Mm -hmm. And he's using a lot of Jewish slang and a lot of language that means something to the Jewish life in the Old Testament, right? And when it talks about visiting the widows and the orphans, it's not talking about poor people according to the natural sight. It's talking about those that don't know God's their father. It's talking about a person living as an orphan in the earth, not seeing that God has called himself their father. A widow is talking about a person who's barren and unfruitful in God's life. Well, these guys were not visiting the brokenhearted. They were busy ministering to the rich people because they wanted to be delivered from the torment they yeah, felt right. by getting favor from the rich people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, so true. that's why James would come and say that the wrath of a man worketh not the righteousness of God. Mm-hmm. He's not talking about anger there. That no. word wrath means no. zeal, that's passion. Right. And he says, I see you guys are having hard times, and I see you have a zeal for peace. You want your soul to be restored really bad. I see you want it bad, but your desire for peace cannot produce the righteousness of God. It can't produce the peace of God's life in you. Only God can produce his peace in you. Yes. And the way he produces his peace in you is by doing a work to braid your life together with himself. That's why he talks about being begotten, again, from the word of truth. Amen. Right? Mm-hmm. And then the work would be to continue in that. He said, you, you beheld your, yourself in the perfect law of liberty, but you've gone away and forgotten what yeah, type God. of a man you are. Do you know what type of a man we are? Mm-hmm. We're not an earthy man. No. Mm-hmm. We're not an earthy man. No. Paul talked about the earthy man and the spiritual man. Yeah. Our life is not but dust. Our life has not been born from the dust of this ground. Our life is made of a heavenly substance. We are a heavenly man. Heaven and earth have collided inside of us. Our life has been born from above. It hasn't been born from this earth. So how can this earth do anything to harm my life? Amen. Glory to God. It can't. Now in the day, the earth comes to my house to harm my life. And I need peace. If I do the work of continuing in the gospel truth itself, it will produce peace in me. That's right. But if I don't continue in the gospel it truth will. itself, and I look to my own work to try to gather peace to myself, yeah. then it's dead. Yeah. It's powerless to produce peace in me. Amen. That's what James is talking Amen. about. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? I, guys, I, I promise you, the carnal mind wants to do everything it can to get your sight off of what God has done. That's right. Amen. Yes. We don't actually believe that God can produce his life in us. Right. We all the time want to talk about what we need to do, what we need to do, what we need to do. I'll speak as a fool now. Because there's nothing special about me, like Paul said. But if we want to talk about what people do, I do more than everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? So what I'm saying does not leave you lazy sitting on the couch. Mm -hmm. 
Like I said, you become a man possessed. You become a woman possessed with the life of God yeah. if you will just continue in the good work God's performed. Yeah. And if you will not let anything move you off of that good work. Because inside of the good work of God is a tree of life. Right? And a person filled with the Holy Spirit does not need to be told mm -hmm. to do good things. In yeah. fact, no. you better get out of their way because it's going to take 10, 20, 30 yeah. people to keep them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's going to take 10, 20, 30 people to keep them mm -hmm. from doing it. Right? Yeah. Does that make some sense? Yes. No. <laughs> That's the work. Yes. The work is to allow yourself to be persuaded and then to continue in it. And I gotta, I'm going to tell you, it's, it can be difficult to continue to look to the work of God mm -hmm. when the world nails you to a tree. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think all of us have been tempted to try to gather peace to ourselves. Sure. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. When I was a little boy, I became tormented by a traumatic event in my life, and I sat in that trauma for a little while, but eventually I broke down. I couldn't handle the anxiety I felt anymore, and I started trying to gather peace to myself. Mm -hmm. And do you know what that resulted in? Me being a drug addict. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Do you see how I was looking to my own strength right. to produce life? Mm -hmm. James talks about sin. When, it's con when lust is conceived in our heart, then comes sin. What's lust? Lust is not, I want to go lay with the prostitute. That, you've already lusted by the time you're laying with the prostitute. Lust is talking about when you lust after peace, when you lust after joy, when you lust after love, when you lust after the fruit of the Spirit through the world or through the strength in your own hand. When you lust after the fruit of God's life through the strength in your own hand, that conceives sin in you. Do you know what sin is? To walk after the flesh. That's what James is talking about. He's trying to remove the lust from their heart. And he's trying to remind them that God has caused death to pass over them. Right? Turning them back to the perfect law of liberty. Turning them back to the perfect law Which of liberty. Which serves them with the true peace. Which serves them with the true peace. That's the work. <laughs> right? That's the work. We can just, we'll just read it real quick. And you're hearing James like you've never heard it. <laughs> Hold on, listen to this. But whoso looks into the perfect yeah. law of liberty and continues in it, Amen. what? The perfect law of liberty. That's right. Them being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. What deed? Continuing in the perfect law of liberty. Right. What's That's the right. work that he's exhorting them to do? Continue, to Continue in the perfect law of liberty. That's Continue right. to believe. Continue to believe. Right? Yep. Amen. That's the deed. That's the work. That's right. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when they say when they say you know James uh, the brother of Jesus got it all wrong. <laughs> oh please. <laughs> oh I mean, man. I mean when you when you hear statements like that you got to think. Uh, <laughs> that's about as carnal as you can get yeah to be honest James is one of the most uh, <laughs> grace filled letters in the entire Bible yes it is the problem is we've struggled to read it in its right context mm -hmm. and we've turned it into things that it's not uh -huh. right he talks about even the devils believe mm -hmm. even the devils believe he says mm -hmm. When he talks about even the devils believe, he's not talking about having the faith of God there. No. He's no. talking about even the devils believe God exists. That's but right. believing God exists Don't is not the work That's of right. faith. No. That's right? That's right? That's These right. Jewish guys were still yeah. believing God existed, That's but they weren't right. continuing in the perfect law of liberty. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Can I say something? Are you asking me? I'm just a guest. Uh, <laughs> Can I say something, anybody? Go for yeah. it. Oh, go for it. Uh, you know, when you're talking about this, it takes me back to Hebrews 3, where it's talking about how that they couldn't enter in mm -hmm. to the promised land. Yep. And he concludes, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. They could not enter into that promised land that God had provided for them and ensured that then that he would give them the victory. But they could not see it. They could not see the faith of God. They could not see what God saw. They only saw according to the mind of Adam. And 
it goes on to say in chapter 4, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left to us of entering into rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the, uh, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well mm -hmm. unto them. Mm -hmm. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And that word mixed, it doesn't mean mix up your faith. It means be in union yeah. with the faith. The faith. Yeah. Okay? To believe, I mean, the faith, you know, the scripture tells us that, that herein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith. From is the word ek, the origin of faith. Okay? The gospel is relating to us what God believes to persuade our heart to believe what he believes. And this is why the scripture says that Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. Because they said, let's go in and take the land. Okay? Because you know what? They saw what God saw. Yeah. Right. And his old James is saying the same thing. When we can see what God believes and continue to believe what God believes, <coughs> We enter into his rest. Right. Yeah. Because the scripture says in chapter 4, it says, it says in verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Mm -hmm. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works there as God go. did here. Listen, yeah. unless your heart is persuaded that you are perfect and lacking nothing, your heart can't go to rest. And if your heart won't go to rest, your flesh won't go to rest, and you'll try to continue to get life through what you do. That's right. But once you see what God sees about you, you say, baby, it's finished. <laughs> Amen. And I just rest in his love. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. We'll just read the verse, James 2, 14. What does it, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith. They were telling James, we have faith. What mm -hmm. does a prophet, though a man say he have faith and hath not works? Mm -hmm. Can faith save him? How many of you were like me and thought that was talking about eternal salvation? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many of you just read that right into the text? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's talking about eternal salvation. Well, if you go back to chapter 1. Yeah. Scary. <laughs> let's see you know, what it I says. I didn't know. I didn't understand it. Yeah. Let's see. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Yeah. Yeah. Save your souls from what? Torment. Yeah. You ever felt torment in your heart? Oh, yeah. Ever felt anxiety? Mm -hmm. do, you need, do you need to be saved from that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely you do. So the context there is these guys having hard times, and they're being tormented in their soul. And he's telling them to continue in the word of truth that came in Jesus for the saving of your soul. Now you go to James 2.14. What does it profit you if you say you have faith, but you don't do the work of continuing in the gospel truth itself? Right. Can that gospel truth produce peace in you in no. the day you encounter tribulation no. if you don't continue in it? No. no. It can't. That's right. How did Jesus, how was Jesus able to take a nap during a storm? He believed the gospel. That's right. He believed yeah. the good news. Yeah. And what good news did Jesus believe? Yeah. He was braided to God. Yeah. He was the Father was in him and he was in the Father. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And right? the Father said, Get in the boat and go to the other side. Exactly. So if the Father said, Get in the boat and go to the other side, guess what? I'm, I'm going, going to the other side. <laughs> well, not only that, Jesus knew the volume of the book was written about him. Absolutely. And he knew why why yeah. he was sent and he was he believed, he believed that. You know, the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, and the resurrection. He believed yeah. the gospel, which served him with peace through his whole life. Absolutely. Ministry. And the yeah. same gospel serves us with that same life and peace. Mm -hmm. And I like that because where he's talking about saved, there was a great tribulation and persecution in those days. And that's what he was mainly speaking to, you know. And... Uh, it would behoove us because as Americans we've had it so we've had such a pampered life we haven't really experienced trouble like they experienced 
okay? But we need to be established in this now, okay? <laughs> I mean, we're, but it will serve us. He's saying it will serve. Amen. Like Jesus says, I, I give you peace. Not that the, not as the world gives you, I give mm-hmm. you. So there is, the, there is a peace and there's a joy and there's this uh, fruit of the Spirit that, that, that God uh, serves our heart with. Yes. And it's through believing the gospel. Amen. But continuing to believe it. Yes. Thank continuing you. to believe it. Amen. So, I have a co-worker who um, will talk about this very thing, believing and, and that, that, you know, that Jesus is the beast and all this kind of stuff. But as soon as anything happens in her world, she falls apart. Uh, she falls apart. I mean, yeah. really falls apart. Yeah. And that would be what this is, what James is describing here. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because if you don't continue in the perfect law of liberty when you encounter hard times, we all desire peace. Yeah. Desire and lust are different. But if you don't mix your desire for peace with the work of God, mm. that desire is going to quickly turn into lust. Yeah. Where you're <laughs> lusting after peace through your own strength. Yeah. That's when James says sin is conceived in your yeah. heart. Because now, like me, I desired peace when I had that traumatic event in my life. I wanted it more than anything. I started with the pure desire. I need peace. I need peace. I need peace. But I didn't know the faith of God. That's right. Mm-hmm. Right? I didn't understand the work that he did in Jesus to serve me with life. I didn't understand he liberated my life from being held in this world. My mind was all the time filled with all the harm that was coming to my life and how it was destroying my life. I need peace. I need peace. I need peace. Eventually, what happened, because I didn't mix my desire for peace with the faith that came in Jesus, mm-hmm. is it turned into lust. Mm-hmm. And when then lust was conceived, it became sin, mm-hmm. where I began looking to my own hands to try to get peace. Mm-hmm. It's called self-medication. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I began, began doing lots of drugs to medicate myself to bring myself peace because I didn't continue in the perfect law of liberty. And so I didn't find peace. And that desire turned quickly into lust. And then when lust was conceived, then I started trying to gather peace to myself. And the easiest way I could do it was through drugs. A lot of people desire love. And they don't mix their desire for love with the love of God or the work God did to deliver them from death which is where his love is contained. And if they don't mix their desire for love with the Lord of glory, that desire is going to quickly turn into lust. And when lust is conceived in your heart, you're going to start trying to gather love to yourself. Do you know how you're going to do that? There's a number of different ways. You could do it in relationships. You could do it trying to get acceptance from people. There's a number of different ways that can work itself out in you. Right? None of it will produce peace. None of it will produce love. Or satisfaction. Or satisfaction. And that's the point James is making. Honestly, guys, that's what we encounter every day. Every day we encounter things that tell us one thing you lack. Mm -hmm. Probably within the last couple days, all of us encountered something Mm -hmm. that said Mm -hmm. one thing you lack. Well, we have a desire to not feel lack, don't we? Well, the work James is talking about is to behold yourself in the perfect law of liberty Mm -hmm. and see that your life's been liberated from this world. And when you think about the life you have, even while you're in this world, don't look at the world around you. Don't look at what you have in the world. Don't look at what's happening to you in the world, but rather set your affection above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God for your life is hid in him. And if you, when you feel lack in this world, if you see your life hid in Jesus, do you know what's going to happen inside of you? Your heart's going to tell you your life is very good. My life is very good. I promise you the only thing that you'll ever hear when you behold your life in Jesus is your life is very good. (laughs) And then all of a sudden you'll find lack sent away from you. And you'll find abundance coming pouring out of your heart. Right? That's what James is getting at. That's what we all need. It, we need our lives to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Well, what's the work we can do to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit? That's what James is talking about. That's right. That's what, he's, that's what the body of Christ needs to hear. Mm-hmm. Because I promise right. you, if we start finding our lives animated with the fruit of the Spirit, oh. you ain't got to tell somebody they no. need to do good no. things. Mm-hmm. Amen. You think you had to tell Jesus he had to do good no. things? No. Do you think the Father sat Jesus down and was like, listen, Jesus, yes, faith is okay, <laughs> but you got to make sure you're doing this and that and the other. Doing the work. Do you think that the Father said that to Jesus? No. Then how can we come and explain it that way for us? We're supposed to behold how this whole thing works in Jesus. In the same way it came forth in Jesus is how the Father has given that it would come forth in us. Right? 
Yeah, the life will live itself. The life will live itself. That's why Paul come and said that he was crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, it's Christ that's living in me. What he said is the power behind my life is not my own strength. The power behind my life is not even the life that I have from the world. The world is not the power behind my life. It's the very Christ that's living inside of me. Christ is the power behind my life. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. That's the work. You continue in the faith that was revealed in Jesus. Jesus himself even said, you think we'd listen to Jesus? <laughs> it's a famous verse. We all know this. I can see that you guys know the scriptures. Mm-hmm. I can see all you guys love the Lord. Amen. It's easy to see. Mm-hmm. One thing is needful. Yeah. He said. Mm-hmm. One thing. What, what was she doing? Sitting at the feet of yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Now, we get so caught up in just Jesus the person. <laughs> and yes, Jesus is a man. And hallelujah for that. But we have to also understand Jesus is the faith of God. And what Jesus was talking about is the faith of God will create his life in you. Mm. If you will sit and behold the faith of God. Paul was saying, I behold the faith of God. The life I live in this world, I live beholding the faith that was revealed in Jesus Christ on the cross. And as I live beholding the faith that was in the Son of God's heart when he was being nailed to a cross, it has formed within me the very life of God. And we ought not be surprised by that because Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are his workmanship. That's right. And do you know how he creates us in the image of Christ Jesus? Through his faith. That's right. That's how he creates everything. everything. But we've taken that word faith there and made it into a verb. Yeah. That word faith in Ephesians 2 is also a noun. Yeah. And it says this faith is not of yourselves. You don't drum it up. No, it's, it's a, a gift, gift from God, it says. Right. Right. Well, Paul later says in Romans that God gave to everyone the measure of faith. Right. He's talking about the Lord Jesus. Amen. Yeah. But we've turned faith into what we're going to do That's instead right. of what we behold. Yep. And if we would just see faith is the word that was made flesh in Jesus, and we stopped trying to work faith, do you know what would happen? Faith would do a work in us. Amen. And faith would produce in us the very life of Christ. Amen. That's why Paul said, the life I live in this human body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And he said, that was the power to find my life animated by the life of Christ. Amen. Right? That's right. Amen. Like I can get excited. There's a lot of juice in the faith <laughs> that was revealed in Jesus. Oh, yes. The juice oh, yes. you need yes. is the faith that was revealed oh, yes. in the Lord Thank Jesus. Uh-huh. That faith that was revealed in the Lord Jesus created everything. Yes. It holds everything yeah. together. That faith is the light that entered the earth in Genesis yeah. that brought forth order in the oh, midst of the chaos and the darkness. And that faith will bring forth order inside of you. Yes, that Lord. faith will give your heart shape and form. That faith will produce the very life of God inside of you. Yes. If we can just stop for one moment and realize it's a now. Amen. <laughs> and sit at the feet of faith. Amen. And if you're struggling with how, this, this, this thought about faith, God is good. You don't have to understand it all. You can walk out of here tonight and tell God, I don't know how to behold the faith. I'm not sure I know exactly what that is. But I want to see it. He will minister it to you. Yes, mm-hmm. He will. He's faithful. He will minister it Amen. to you. He ever liveth to minister Amen. this to you. That's right. Right? Yes. The most powerful prayers I ever prayed to God was, that don't make no sense to me. <laughs> I see it. I can't. I can't disagree intellectually, but that don't make no sense. Yeah. I remember when I saw Psalm 23 was still talking about Jesus on the cross. We read Psalm 22 and we see that that's Jesus yeah. prophetically, and then somehow we get to Psalm 23 and we think it's no longer Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's Jesus on the cross. Peter would say in his letter that Jesus looked to the shepherd and bishop of his soul. Yeah. When he was being nailed to the cross. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Psalm 23, yeah. this is what I told God, that don't make no sense to me. That's Jesus on the cross, look what he says. Mm-hmm. The Lord is my shepherd, I do not yeah. lack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was challenging for me. Mm-hmm. I said, Lord, how does a guy, how does a dude nailed to a cross say he doesn't lack? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That did not make any sense to me. And I was just <laughs> honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, Lord, you're going to have to do something about that because... I do not. And what does it go on to say? He maketh me to lie down in the tender green grass. He leadeth me beside the still waters of grace. What that really means in the Hebrew is that he quieted the storm 
of the death that was swirling around me with his grace right it goes on to say he prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies Mm -hmm. isn't that talking about Jesus Mm -hmm. in the midst of the cross Mm -hmm. and then what does he say yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death isn't that Jesus on the cross Mm -hmm. I will fear no evil for thou art with me Lord then he goes on to say my cup runneth over and I was like, Lord, increase. I was like, Peter, increase my faith. I was like, how does this guy say his cup runneth over on the cross? I knew I wasn't seeing something. And I just told God, I don't understand. But I'm available. I'm available. Bring it forth in me. If you brought it forth in Jesus, I know. Jesus said he was filled with meekness. He said, take my yoke upon you. That means doctrine. He's rabbi. Take my doctrine upon you. For as light and as easy. And I'm full of meekness. Do you know what meekness means? Meekness means to think little of your own strength and your own ability and to think much of God's ability. And so what that tells me is that when Jesus was on the cross, he didn't think he needed to work it up to say his cup runneth over. He saw that the Father could produce abundance in him even when he was nailed to the cross. And I said, if you could produce it in the Lord Jesus, then I know you can produce it in me. And I just admitted it. I can't do it. I can't say my cup's runneth over when I'm nailed to a tree, Lord. I can't do it. And you know what I found? He produced it in me. Amen. And I actually find the life of God that I read about in the scriptures having been born in me now. Mm. Because I've been beholding faith instead of trying to work faith. Mm-hmm. I see that the exhortation of God is to continue in my good work, not your own good works. He didn't ordain you to walk in your own good works. That's not what that says in the Greek. It says that he ordained you to walk in his good work because you're his workmanship. It just finished saying that we're his workmanship. And then we get to the next sentence and we think it's talking about we're going to walk in our own good works. You're not your own workmanship. You cannot create yourself in Christ Jesus. Do you know who can? God. And it's just like with Adam. God did a good work for Adam and he ordained or created Adam to walk in his good work. That's the only thing Adam had to do was walk in God's good work. Yeah. And he would have been created in the image of Christ yeah. Jesus. Yes. Mm-hmm. His nakedness would have been clothed upon. But he didn't. Mm-hmm. Right? He walked in his own yeah. good work. Amen. And then what happened? His yeah. nakedness was uncovered. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and brought, he brought death into the earth. Mm-hmm. You know, I can see how Jesus on the cross could say, My cup runneth over. When I read um, Psalms 16:11, it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And only a, a person that has the Spirit of God can understand that you can be in the midst of hell and have the joy of the Lord and the peace of God that passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. And in Hebrews 12, it tells us, Wherefore, seeing we are also encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, the lie that tries to persuade us that we're orphans, which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who, no, not our faith, that's been injected in there. It is finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, Mm-hmm. And that word despised, it makes you think, oh, I hate this shame. But it doesn't mean that. It means to disesteem and to think nothing of it. Uh-huh. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, he's saying the same thing the Apostle Paul said. The, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, I don't consider the present tribulation even worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And so, you know, when you when you set your mind on the things above and you see uh, the end and where you're going and what you have, 
okay? Some temporary thing that comes your way, you disesteem it. This is nothing compared to the eternal life that I have in myself, okay? Yeah, amen. The Lord didn't right. promise us a bowl of cherries. Amen. As a matter of fact, he did promise us that we would have trouble. Mm -hmm. In the world. Amen. He mm -hmm. said, That's you well. will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Yeah. I've overcome the world. So if you have the same spirit that raised Christ from mm -hmm. the dead, dwelling in your mortal body, honey, he's going to raise you <laughs> up. Yeah. And he's going to give you power over every situation Absolutely. that comes your way. Absolutely. Hallelujah. You know, in James 1, it says, count it all joy when you come into diverse temptations. Okay? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. When, when contradictory circumstances come against you. You know, contradictory circumstances come against us all the time, and they've got a voice, and they're speaking, and they're saying, where's your father now? Where's God now? Amen? But you know, that word count, it means it's a strength and form of the word that means to lead, to bring forth, to command with official authority and to rule over. You know, joy, joy is the voice of what you believe. If you believe you're more than a conqueror, your heart is filled with joy. Amen. Okay? And that's going to lead you right out of that situation. Amen. Joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, it doesn't mean your situation is going to end, but you will have I'm joy in that it, situation. Baby. Amen. <laughs> it's You'll just have joy like and peace Paul in that and situation. Silas. I mean, they were rejoicing and praising God. Yeah. Amen. And uh, yeah, the, there was an earthquake and the prison doors opened. But you know, they didn't go anywhere because yeah. they cared more about that jailer. They're having too good a time. Amen. They, you know, they they knew that if they left, that jailer would have been executed because they escaped on his watch. They were more concerned. Love is more concerned about the other guy than itself. Mm -hmm. And you know, love is a great salvation because it gets your eyes off of you. Mm -hmm. Amen. You're not looking at you. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying no. that that doesn't end the that doesn't necessarily end the circumstance coming against you. No, but boy, you can have great joy through it. The, 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 but the, you want to be careful because you're not. It's, it's not that I need to have joy through it. He, what he's saying is there's a faith that will produce peace in you. That's right. In the day you encounter tribulation. Right. Absolutely. So be encouraged, knowing that this faith that was revealed in Jesus has been tried in the fire. That's right. Because when he was nailed to the cross, that faith produced joy in him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so what he's saying is, in the day you encounter tribulation, don't be derailed, no. knowing that this faith we're believing on, it's precious, it's pure, mm. it's been tried. Yeah. We've seen that it can produce the fruit in the, of the Spirit in a guy nailed to yes. a tree. So when you encounter tribulation and you need peace, Count it all joy knowing that this faith we're believing on, it's full of power to serve you with peace. Amen. Right? That's right. And so it, it will stabilize you immediately because you'll see, right? You'll yes. see that, oh, yeah, okay, I have the peace I need. It's right That's here. That's right. And you'll behold faith, yeah. and it will produce peace in you. That's true. Right? Amen. The beginning and end of faith, Jesus. That's right. Amen. Does that make sense about James? Mm -hmm. yes. That was the first question. <laughs> I was going to talk about